So this afternoon, to begin with, for a half an hour, we have a question and answer. So um, Ajahn's requested the easy questions first, please. So who would like to come up with the first question? That's easy. Oh, this is the roving mic, so... Oh, I OK. I better do a bit of in the back there. Very good. Uh, hello, Ajahn. Uh, yes. How are you? My question is, how are you? How are you? Now, that is a very, very difficult question. <laughs> first of all, the you. Now, what do you mean by that you? Like, how is my, my nose? My nose is well ahead. How is my feet? My feet are nice and cosy. What part of you? <laughs> the whole. Uh, so first of all, is it reminds me of a lovely little one-frame cartoon we have at um, our meditation center, Jana Grove. And the cartoon, there is, I know it's not one frame, it's like three frames. The first one is a very angry man comes to see the monk and because you know it has to be a cartoon you just see he has a big sign I want happiness and the monk looks at him and said give me the sign and straight away he said your first problem I so he rubs it out what does that leave want happiness the second problem want so he scrubs that out and then the monk holds up the sign what's left happiness <laughs> that's the problem i want happiness the i and the want is the problem so how are you and i'm saying, I'm saying just like this that's how i am i'm here isn't that good enough <laughs> yeah, well, well, good, very good, excellent, it's okay, so how am I, I'm like this, and of course, you know, you can see, you just noticed that uh, I'm expanding, <laughs> and there's many reasons for that, I mean, one of them is, I don't know, because uh, when I was at university, I studied theoretical physics, and it is, it is well known, astrophysicists have seen this and they've confirmed this for such a long time, the universe is expanding. We live in an expanding universe. And so what do you expect? You know, just you become one with the universe, so if the universe is expanding, so do I. And of course, you know, if you keep going on like this, sooner or later on, you have the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the case that, you know, as a monk, you know, you just let things go, you have a happy life, you're peaceful. You know, these problems come up, but you let them go. Because you let them go, you don't worry about anything. And it's a worry which keeps you thin. Doctors tell me this all the time, that Ajahn Brahm, you need to worry some more. <laughs> and if I worry, then you lose weight. No, you're not really agree with me yet, are you? No, okay. But I did tell this little story last night, that it's, it was, well, half true. Because when I was over in the United States, you know, I was going through the, uh, what's it called? You know, the customs, the Homeland Security check. And they looked at me and they said, what have you got underneath your robe, a jumper?" <laughs> and they did ask me, they said, are you wearing a suicide belt? <laughs> they actually asked me that. And so I, I told them, I said, no, it's not a suicide belt, it's just fat. <laughs> and the guy said, same thing. <laughs> I made up that last one. <laughs> That's not what he said. <laughs> okay. So thank you for opening up. We've got some questions in the box here. Yeah, okay. You've got the box questions. So okay, you can actually ask them. 
Yes, that'd be weird. Um, oh dear. This is not my question. Are you um, sure? If you weren't a monk, what would you be? If I weren't a monk, what would I be? Probably if I weren't a monk, I'd be a nun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Because I like this monastic life. <laughs> yeah? Um, this is a serious one, actually. I thought the last one was serious. <laughs> okay, go um, on. How do I fulfill my duty to take care of my father who had sexually abused me? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So first of all, is uh, depends if he has um, um, made amends. If he's first of all acknowledged, admitted it. First of all, so you know to be honest about it. But sometimes you can't uh, force that. So you try and look after him, like you look after all other beings. He is your father. Why he did that? It's you know how do we know? Uh, what, what goes through people's minds? I must admit, it's, it's not sort of uh, denial, but my family that didn't ever see anything which was remotely similar to um, child abuse, no, not sexual abuse, and it was like an eye-opener for me to be able to you know, hear that parents would do such a thing to their children. You know, because family was like a loving family. You don't abuse a kid like that. But anyway, if it's someone like your father, if he does sort of admit his mistakes and just say, you know, I really am sincerely sorry, then if that was my father, I would look after him up to the max forgiveness. Because I never see that um, even the worst of abuses can ever be solved, you know, with hatred. Just what the Buddha kept on saying. Hatred doesn't cease by more hatred, it only ceases by love. And it's the thing of third and fourth verse in the Dharmapada that, you know, this wasn't meaning sexual abuse, but it is saying, you know, he abused me, he cheated me, he uh, beat me. Anger never ceases with someone who harbors those thoughts. So it's wonderful if we can learn to let go and forgive. We can't forget, we never will forget. But you know, to, to want to punish somebody, just that creates a lot of pain in our own heart. We've been hurt once, why should we let them hurt us again? Obviously to protect yourself and make sure that uh, a person never does that to other people. But there comes a time when uh, to give person a chance. As I said last night, quarantine. A bit more care, a bit more make sure that they are not being put in a position where they could do such things. And make sure that see if it's possible uh, so that they can, uh, we can give them the chance, the space to grow and to, um, to move away from that terrible, terrible thing which they did. But as for, for you, that's you know, your parents, that if you keep on feeling anger, feeling you're worthless, feeling that you've done something wrong there, that abuse continues in your memory. So that's one of the reasons why every time a person remembers with anger or with shame some abuse, which you received from somebody else. Every time you remember that, you're allowing them to hurt you again. Psychologically. That's why, the old, to put it very simply, someone calls you a pig. Every time you remember that, they're calling you a pig again. And you feel upset. So the most wonderful thing to do is to You've been hurt once, you've been cheated once, you've been abused once, or it could be many times, but don't let that 
that experience abuse you every time you think about it. See if you can be free. And you see people who have suffered terrible, terrible things and they do have a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. And forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiveness is taking away the blame. Taking away, I want to hurt somebody back. Or that I want to make sure they never have any happiness. Sometimes at the time you think you can't live a happy life. A fulfilling life, but you can. Just when you think, oh they've destroyed me, they've destroyed my life. No, you can actually grab your life back. And live a happy, beautiful life. And, oh, okay. This is uh, one of those groups. I, I told a story many times, probably last year I was here. It was actually quite moving for me to, when I was invited to a group called Assets. It was the Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. And you, the, this was the West Australian branch. I'm sure there's branches in Melbourne somewhere. Because there are people who come to this country, refugees, and they've come from the, literally the torture chambers of this world. You know, being beaten, tortured, sexually abused. You know, not just once, so many, so many times. And when they tell you the stories, it does make your, your skin crawl what one human being could do to another. And somehow or other they survive, physically. And they come to a, a country like Australia, you know, which will take them in and will support them with physically. But they still have the trauma of it. And that trauma just means that their body is free, but their mind is never free. And you can see that it cripples their emotional world. But fortunately, these, uh, this group, these groups have a lot of success. And what really moved me was to, to see how one of those stories which I wrote a long time ago, a very famous story, was one of the key strategies they were using. And that was the old story of opening the door of your heart. And of course, when I get invited to some of these places, you know, sometimes I'm like, why? Why are you inviting me here? And they say, because this is one of our key stories we got from you, and we want to say thank you. And, and they're still using it, apparently. And what it was, that so when the person did feel safe enough, they felt they were ready to do this, they were in a quiet place where they felt not pushed in their own way, they would do a little visualization, visualizing a little heart in their chest. And it was like a, a Valentine's Day heart, not a sort of a, a real heart. If you're a doctor, you know, that sort of heart which is all over the place, a piece coming out here, a piece coming out there with all the arteries and veins and stuff, nothing like that, but just a simple heart, like on a Valentine's Day card. And then they imagine this little um, double door in the heart. And then the next stage they visualize that door opening up. And there they are, standing inside their own heart, the part of them which they can embrace, the part of them which they feel comfortable with, the part of them which wasn't hurt, abused, demeaned. And then they look out from the warmth of their own heart and down out in the cold, on the concrete, on the floor, so there is that little boy, that little girl, or that young woman who was abused, as if that part of them is outside, cold, alone, frightened. And then they imagine the stairway coming out from their heart, going down to the ground. And they invite all those little girls up. Come up. I'm never, never again going to uh, exclude you be afraid of you, or be ashamed of you. Come in. And all those young men who are badly beaten, the political activists who were shut away and tortured, all of those little people who are part of you, 
you invite in. And they have this wonderful cathartic moment. These frightened people who are part of you coming up, the door of my heart's open to you as well. Embracing, coming in. And there's this great sense of change happens. Before, people were ashamed of that part of your life. Pushed it away, excluded it, tried to blot it out, tried to get rid of it. And instead, you take it all in. <coughs> Embrace it. And I've seen some of the survivors. And they say it's wonderful that they can never forget what happened to them. But it becomes part of them. It becomes who they are. And they're no longer ashamed of it. They're actually at peace with it. So it's a wonderful thing which can happen. But it has to be in your own time. You can't force it. But as for the, uh, the person who did that, especially it's the person you trusted so much and they let you down incredibly. If you can, the best thing is to, to forgive. If you can. doesn't mean sort of allowing to continue on. It's forgive and learn. Take appropriate action so you can protect yourself and others afterwards. So that's it's a very powerful question because it's amazing just how many people have been abused. It has to be acknowledged first of all though. One of the problems with the, uh, the Royal Commission was finding out how many times people weren't believed. They were, first of all, they felt bad enough that it was kept on thinking it was you know, their fault, they felt so demeaned and they're not to be believed, not to be heard, which just added worse, made it worse. Anyway, another question, yeah? Um, does a person participating in one of your retreats have to take the eight precepts? If yes, are there any exceptions for a person with a facial skin disease having to use a camouflage cream to refrain from taking the last precept. Thank you. Dash. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, they were, they, uh, that last precept is not using things which beautify or adorn you. And some monks are so beautiful, that's why they don't put on any because they just can't make it any more <laughs> But it's all about sort of, you know, using stuff to make yourself attractive or for good looking. And, oh, you know that it's hard enough for a monk, but there was one time when I had to wear makeup. It, it's true, because <laughs> I do some very interesting things in my life, but this time I was uh, going uh, to do an interview in the TV studio. And I said, this was years ago, you don't need to make up these days in the TV studio, there's much better lighting. And I said, you have to wear makeup. Said, no, I'm a monk, I'm a man. So no choice. And so I said, has anyone else had an exception? The only one who had an exception in that studio is Channel 7, or I forget Channel 7 or Channel 9. And anyway, they said, Liam Gallagher of Oasis, he absolutely refused. But apparently he's a bit of a scallywag anyway, so they didn't want to get into a fight with him. But everyone else had to. So I had to go in there. And it was Ajahn Bamali. He was accompanying me that day. And, and he was looking at me and laughing. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but afterwards he had to go on TV and get his makeup done. So if you laugh at people like that, it comes back to you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's only because of the TV, because otherwise, otherwise you get all sort of too shiny. So in, <laughs> anyway, the, if that's from the, the, um, on the retreat, of course, you can uh, wear the cosmetics if you need to. But it doesn't really matter if you've got some facial condition. Wonderful, just don't hide it. 
You know, you say, well, should I just, when I teach, come to BS3, should I wear like a girdle to sort of hold my... <laughs> of course not. You know, just let it all hang out. <laughs> they used to say. No, but further on the retreats, the eight precepts, you know, that is the basic, it's just simplifying your life. But this sometimes people have to have, uh, they may be diabetic, they may have, be on antibiotics, and they need something in the evening. And of course we make exceptions, you know, if they really need something. So we always have to make exceptions because it's, these are precepts, we will refrain from these. It's not that you'll be prohibited, absolutely, and you'll be put against a wall and shot if you do any of these <laughs> things. It's, it's, it is a lot of compassion there. So, yeah, if you want to go on a retreat and you, you know, you've got some, and you have to wear some ointment or something, fine, no problem at all. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, the abuser. The victims. Other victims, yeah. It's actually for the victims is you know, first of all to to realize you do have a choice to let go. You don't have to keep carrying the pain of the past. And this is one thing which keep on trying to to put forward. This is classic Buddhism. You can let go. Unfortunately, sometimes people think that's not, a po not possible. Case study, case history of that, there was a lady who came to see me, came to our meditation group over in Perth. This was many years ago, so I don't mind telling the details. That she had a nice little happy family, so she thought, two twins, Donna and Damien, and uh, when she came home from work, police were at her home because I found out the two children, two twins, had been, the 11 year olds, were being sexually abused by her husband. And, you know, she couldn't see the signs. And one of the reasons she couldn't see the signs is because, you know, psychologically she was torn. She still loved that man. And the idea that the person she loved, the father of her children, could do such a thing was just so so impossible to, to accept. She, you know, she was in a psychological denial. The uh, teachers at school could see it. And so because of that, she was you know, doubly felt you know, guilty, not protecting her children, and you know, not seeing the signs. She felt it was almost her fault. And at the same time, this you know, whole marriage was just obviously, was just totally shattered. So, you know, he had to be taken away, eventually went to jail. And uh, that she had compulsory counselling from a psychiatrist. But she also had me as well to take her through this. And because she'd been, she was an a English Caucasian. Because she'd been coming to the our Buddhist lessons, was meditating long enough, she could come to a state of forgiveness really quickly. And with that, her two children came to that state of forgiveness as well. They were following their mum. And what it meant that uh, she came to see me, you know, halfway through the counselling, saying, Ajahn Brahm, look, can you help? Because I've forgiven, I'm not angry at my ex-husband. Of course, I, I don't want to see him and he can't be my husband anymore, but I'm not angry with him, I don't want to punish him anymore. And the psychologist, or psycho sorry, psychologist, said, no, you're in denial. You know, you've got to get angry, and I'm not going to let you, you know, go through this until you, you, know, you really get angry at your husband, because that's what I thought you should be doing. <laughs> and so I had to you know, write a letter, quite a long letter, to the psychologist, you know, saying that you know, this is a Buddhist way, and this lady has you know, been coming for a while, and she's actually gone past and through that hurt, and she hasn't got anger anymore. No love for her husband, but not anger, hasn't gone to, to that extreme. And I convinced the psychiatrist, and I kept in contact with her for many years. She moved over to England, to Essex, 
and you know, started another life. And her children, especially Donna, you know, she did well at school. And then I think they sent me a, she got married and sent me a picture of their baby. So it wasn't just that they were, they were um, hiding this or, or that she had actually moved on pretty quickly. She had to let go. It was an example of acknowledging, forgiving and learning. It can be done. So knowing you have a choice, it can be done. And there's nothing wrong with not allowing them to hurt you again. That's the important thing. And then once you realize you can do it, then the ways of doing it, the paths, the means, that becomes rather easy. The biggest block is saying, no, I, I can't forgive this. And thinking that some things are unforgivable. There's nothing which is unforgivable. Okay. Yeah, go on. One more. Serious, yeah. Do you get tired of being a teacher and a monk, Arjun? Do I get tired of being a teacher and a monk? That's good. Being tired of being a monk. What else to do in life? If it makes any sense. No. <laughs> now I don't get negative about being a teacher and being a monk. It would be so easy to. Being a monk is pretty easy. Being a teacher is not so bad. But you know that sometimes I was uh, not so much here in Australia, but whenever I go to countries like um, Singapore or Malaysia or the worst of all, Indonesia. <laughs> They're lovely people, but they, they always like taking photographs <laughs> and, and signing books. And it's not just like half an hour. Sometimes that I think one of the records was it was actually what kind, what part it was only a small town, but there was about such a huge number of people wanting their books signed and wanting their photographs taken with me. And it was a queue would last you for two hours. <laughs> signing books, photographs, signing books, photographs, <laughs> signing books, photographs. <laughs> and I really wanted to go to the toilet. <laughs> signing books. <laughs> And you can't escape. So, in the end, now halfway through that, I just thought, no, what am I doing this for? And this was not in the contract when I became a monk. You never <laughs> thought you'd have to end up doing this. You find I'm just, you know, being a monk, just meditating, teaching meditation, staying a long time in your monastery and meditating, living simply. And what am I doing this for? And as soon as I started thinking like that, I realized that was suffering. And uh, I went back to something I've taught before here about the monk who went to teach in a prison and they realized just how tough it is in a Buddhist monastery compared to a jail in Australia. <laughs> the, they, they told this monk, he said, that's terrible, you know, where you live. You know, you, don't, you, you have to sleep on the floor, you can't watch the TV, you can't play sport, you have to eat things in the same bowl. And, and then he said, why don't you come in here and stay with us? And said the prisoner to the monk. <laughs> and he had a point. <laughs> you know, if, if I was in jail, I'd be able to, to have three or four meals a day. I'd be able to, to watch the TV, be able to play ping pong, be able to relax, be able to read, and wouldn't have all these people asking me questions, wouldn't have to travel anywhere. I oh, just really relax. It'd be like, any time I wanted to go on a retreat, personal retreat, all I need to do is to punch a prison officer, three months solitary. <laughs> it's so hard to get three months by myself these days. <laughs> so, but anyway, so, then I started thinking, what's the difference between a prison and a monastery? The only difference is, in monastery, like was all these monasteries, we haven't got enough space, that's why we continue to build. We're not building just to actually to have nice monuments. You know, in Newbury or Dhammasara and Bodhinyana, we built just to get some more huts, so we can have more monks. So all the people who want to become monks and nuns, they can actually do so. At the moment, it's a, we tell people, sorry, you can't ordain. You can't come, no place. And that's honest. You know, that kind of hurts me. They don't have that opportunity. Really good people. 
Anyway, we're trying to solve that as best we can. But uh, one of the reasons why is many people trying to get out of jail and many people trying to get into monasteries. And I realized that a jail is not sort of a uh, somewhere which is harsh or whatever. It's a jail is any place you don't want to be. And freedom is any place you're happy to be. So if I was in prison, I'd be actually quite free. <laughs> but if some people, uh, if I was in a line signing books, I'd put myself in a prison. <laughs> I, I didn't want to be there. And I realized, ah, oh, that's the problem, that's the suffering. Mm. Signing books, being a teacher, being a monk, any moment I don't want to be here, I've made myself a prison. And to be free is just wanting to be here. Just you know, sharing a few moments, having fun. And one of the reasons you know, I have fun, tell jokes, is because that's where I want to be, in a happy space. I want to take you with me. So that's where I want to be. There are just two very quick questions. How old are you? <laughs> How old are I? Okay. No, that's, no, come on, you shouldn't sort of, uh, I just had last, it's actually last month, no, oh, it's June now, two months ago, I celebrated my 800th. <laughs> I, I, 800, I was 800, that's a very big milestone. And sometimes people, hey, come on, our jump arm, I don't lie. I always tell the truth. I'm a monk. It's one of the precepts. Do you, want, do you actually believe I'm now 802? <laughs> Months. <laughs> Why do you have to always follow the way other people do it? They say how old you are. 66 years. That's so boring. Everybody does that. So then you start to say, how old are you in months? So 700 and, so 12 by 66 and a, that's almost coming 67 soon. As I worked it out, last April, yeah, last April was my 800 month birthday. What a shame we didn't come here, could have a big party, 800, happy 800th, Ajahn Prabh. <laughs> that's really cool. So anyway, any of the young people here, anyone who's maybe 11 or 12, years of age or 13, when people ask you, you know, when you try to get into a nightclub, how old are you? Multiply it by 12. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't tell people those. <laughs> and there's just one very last um, short yeah. one as well. No, there's no short question. Are short you questions, famous but worldwide and not only Australia? What? Are you famous worldwide and not only Infamous, Australia? sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes people do recognize you. But that's up to you. What is fame? Who is the most famous person in the world? Probably Donald Trump. <laughs> and I don't want to go there. I don't know if I told you about the, uh, did anyone hear about the assassination attempt on uh, the president? No. no. Didn't hear about that? No. Well, just, he was giving a meeting, uh, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, and this guy, I don't know how he managed to get the gun into the, the auditorium. He stood up, pulled out the gun, pointed it at Donald Trump, and one of the security guards you know, saved his life. The security guard shouted out, Donald Duck! <laughs> and the assassin burst out laughing and he couldn't pull the trigger. <laughs> um, Ajahn, we're, we're sort of time to, to go ahead with the meditation or do you want to take one question from online? What's up to you? <laughs> we'll do an online question, come on. We'll, just, we'll do one online question.
So, Desana from Toronto asks... Wow, from Toronto. Yeah. Sometimes during meditation, it looks like the light in the room is being turned on, then it looks like someone's walking in front of the light. Before I know it, I open my eyes to see what's happening. I'm not sure why it keeps happening, and how can I continue my meditation without interruption? We just don't open your eyes. <laughs> you stay there. And no, it's, it's true that sometimes that we get beautiful lights in our mind. And this is part of the nature, so just don't uh, interfere. Don't interfere with the process. Just let go, you're perfectly safe. So like someone's turned the lights on in the room, you keep on going, just stay there, just be peaceful, be still, and see what happens next. And you feel something, you feel something is walking in front of that light, or just leave it alone, because it's just, you no, know, the light is just dimming slightly, and then it comes back up again, because sometimes you're interfering with it, and then it gets lighter, and lighter, and lighter. Why do you think they call it enlightenment? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Those sorts of things are in one of those books, I think Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, it's about a whole chapter about what we call the nimittas, the beautiful lights in the mind. And of course, in some of the recorded talks, there's even more um, answers about all the different things which happen when the body starts to vanish and you start to see this wonderful light called nimittas. So apologies to the um, people online, but we need to proceed with our program now. So Ajahn, yeah. if we can invite you to... Um, to do meditation? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Okay. We've got an hour and a half, so is an hour and a half meditation? Okay, whatever, down, whatever you would like to do. We can do more questions if you want. It's up to you. What yeah, we what? Okay, this is a democracy. <laughs> so, who wants more questions? Put your hand up. <coughs> who wants meditation to start now? Put your hand up. <laughs> so much for democracy, it's just even, even. <laughs> so, we'll do the, <laughs> the usual way, I'll decide anyway. <laughs> so, let's, let's have one more question and then we do a meditation for, is it half an hour, 40 minutes? And then we we'll uh, do some questions. Yes. The, Forty prog minutes. the program finishes at three, so it's open for you. Okay, so we we'll do one more. We we'll do two more questions, then forty minutes meditation, and then more questions afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, dear Ajahn, my mother is terminally ill. Despite our family's efforts, she isn't getting better. I am away for work, but I meditate and try to comfort her pain using that metta. Am I being naive, Danu? No, of course not, because the mind does have power, and so that you can sort of comfort her pain. But, you know, it's sometimes that we all have to let go one time. So, it's being terminally ill, and that's what uh, somebody said, that the definition of life, what is the meaning of life? And they said, life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is terminal. So a lot of times, and this is, you know, because as Buddhists, you know, you don't believe, you know about rebirth. So there's no doubt there at all. So sometimes, why are you trying keeping a person here when it's time for them to go? Sometimes that's one of the other things we need to change our attitude towards death. That, you know, death is not the end of things and death is not the most important thing in the world trying to keep people alive at all costs. And that is a big problem in our system. Instead, make caring the most important thing. Caring more important than curing. So care for your mum. But you know, time to let her go. Sometimes, yeah, you can see that people, that, fortunately they don't do this anymore. Sometimes they had these old cars, and they're belching smoke, and just rattling. And you know, now they take them off the road, and recycle them. It's the same with me, when I start to belch, and start to keep repeating the same old jokes. <laughs> it's time to take me off the road. <laughs> no, no, seriously, this is uh, something where well, I told the people over in Perth that you know there comes a time 
as a teacher, as a monk, you know, that you know, it's time to, to let go of your monk and just you know, let you retire. I saw this with Venal Thich Nhat Hanh, a very inspiring monk, but then I remember seeing him once and, you know, in a conference in Vietnam and I was sitting next to him and he gave a, a talk and it was, you can see that he wasn't just, you know, the, the same old Thich Nhat, obviously, that he used to be. And his delivery, the inspiration, just wasn't there anymore. It reminded me of these old, like, boxers who were past it, they kept on trying to actually to do a, uh, a comeback. And it would be much nicer to remember them as they were. So, don't just think, because your monks are getting very, very old, they must be wiser. So just you know, let them go after a while. Same as your mum, same as anybody else, with time to sort of let go. And let us fade away. So that's one thing, sir. Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on, yeah. Uh, Renee from Texas asks Ajahn Brahm, do you feel that a family needs to relocate to join a Sangha? Is online enough? Thank yeah. you from uh, yeah. Renee from Texas. Yeah, just sometimes you look at it in the time of the Buddha, you relocate, in other words, to move. In the time of the Buddha, you know, the men and women, monks and nuns, they would just get one simple teaching. And one simple teaching was all they needed, and they go off and practice it. Once they practice that, they became you know, fully enlightened. So we just have so much information now. We have so many manuals about how to meditate, so many sort of words and, and talks and books, but how many people could just take something which really means something to them and use that for the rest of their life. So sometimes I think there's a bit too much information. So inspiration is good, but how much do you need? So for the person, maybe yeah, just make a trip to, to Melbourne or to, to see somebody who you really feel inspired with. But then to see them once, and then just go back and practice. You don't need to be hanging around all the time. So that was really inspiring when you read in the time of the Buddha just how little people needed. And once they learnt it, they really took it on board and practiced it. So I think one of the biggest problems is our lifestyles. We're just so busy in our lifestyles, doing so much. And sometimes, you know, we don't need to do so much. When they go, ever go to places like Singapore, you see all these Australians going shopping down Orchard Road. And when the Singaporeans come to visit monastery, they go shopping in Melbourne or in Perth. Same shops, same brands, same stuff. I said, what are you that for? It got even to the point that one of my so-called disciples, <laughs> <laughs> they came to our temple in Perth with this big um, LCD TV set. You know, it's a big screen, we, 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 um, no, unlike any other, yeah, yeah, but you know, just the, um, the uh, yeah, flat screen, yeah. And they said, do you need a, a, a flat screen for your monastery? Said, of course we don't need that, we don't have TVs in monastery. And they said, it's new. <laughs> oh, what did you buy it for? He said, because it was on sale. I just don't get it. <laughs> they don't need it, but they bought it because it was on sale. And I was telling people in Perth also that very recently, I don't know, we, whenever they come and offer stuff to the monks, they offer all this uh, toilet paper. We've got heaps and heaps of toilet paper. <laughs> Way more than anyone could use. And what are you doing that for? Do you think we're full of, you know what, <laughs> you monks? You know what they said? They said, no, because it's on special. 
So now I get it. I get it now because whenever we get lots of things in this mon in our monastery, probably here at BSV as well, much more than you can use. Which you know, you actually keep you know, pushing in the in the like all the towels. You keep trying to find a place to store them in the BSV. You know, all these towels and says why? Because they're one special. <laughs> so instead of if you need it, buy it. But no, don't just get it because you don't need it. Why do people work so hard for those things? And houses, how big a house do you need? Just remember, the only house, the house you'll spend the most time in is six foot long, two foot wide, <laughs> one and a half foot tall. It's called your coffin. So just save up for that. Everything else is rented. It is, just for the time being. So anyway, that's enough of those sort of stories. Okay, is that the last one from overseas? That's the last one.